Well, thank you so much. Good um, afternoon. Thank you for coming here today. My name is Courtney Jones Carney. I'm the director of ISLSI, which is Interprofessional Student Learning and Service Initiatives. For the last seven years, I've had the honor of managing the President's Symposium and White Paper Project. Um, and so we have discussed seven different topics over that span of time, uh, ranging from cultural competence to interprofessional education, community engagement, and then this year, global literacy. Um, each year, it's amazing to manage this sort of program and to learn all about a new topic um, that otherwise I would not have uh, had the opportunity really to learn about and to um, help these students, our president's fellows, as they um, take this journey from the beginning of the semester to the end with their culminating project where they get to share their recommendations um, for the university, uh, specifically related to uh, educating students to be globally literate. Uh, this year, we had the honor to partner with the office, I'm sorry, the Center for Global Education, Global, sorry, thank you so much, Global Initiatives, uh, and they did a tremendous job in guiding the students as well, and the Writing Center also had a tremendous role in that. Um, so without further ado, Dr. Perman is going to come up and he's going to introduce our topic a little bit further and also introduce our students. So thank you again for coming. Thank you, Dr. Perman. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And um, I really appreciate seeing so many of you uh, here this afternoon. Uh, it's a great turnout. These fellows deserve it, and uh, I appreciate it. So you heard that this year's topic is global literacy. Uh, when this was first broached to me, I didn't quite understand the title. I understand it better now, and you're probably all far ahead of me, uh, but you'll get it. Uh, you know, if I could make one maybe semi-political statement, which I hope I'll uh, be forgiven for, uh, I think we're in an era where, at least for some of our leaders, there's a tendency uh, to turn inward. Uh, there's a lot of, if we're going to be honest with each other, uh, what some might call isolationist rhetoric. So this is particularly uh, a year when uh, I think it's very important that we understand and experience the uh, assumption that we have that the world is really an interconnected set of nations, set of peoples, uh, with an interconnected set of issues that affect us all. Um, and uh, that premise, uh, I think, is very vital to what we're all doing here to prepare ourselves and to conduct our profession. We're going to be culturally competent professionals. We need to be globally literate. Uh, for those of you who read my monthly president's message, and I'm grateful that many of you do, um, I did focus on UMB's role in global education. And uh, happily, it turned out to be very timely, not only because of the fellows' work, but because I think many of you know that our very own Jody Olson from our School of Social Work has just been sworn in as the director of the Peace Corps. Uh, anybody who knows Jody knows that that's a totally appropriate and fitting appointment, and it's a feather in our UMB cap. Um, and uh, uh, I said in the message that I have the privilege of seeing how global experiences affect our students long after their international projects uh, have ended. Uh, students that go overseas, particularly as an interprofessional group, uh, are invited to my office. And um, it's just been wonderful listening to them report, listening to them indicate uh, what they've learned. And some of you know that I tend to use the expression global local. That it is vitally important to
to see people, understand people and problems in other contexts because you find that uh, you go to something that's unfamiliar, maybe uncomfortable to you, and you learn all kinds of things that you probably would never have thought of that you can bring back to your local community. We have lots of examples of those very experiences here. Uh, so I know that global literacy, global opportunities, are fundamentally important uh, to the changes that we're very much about here at UMB, uh, the changes that we need to make in this city, in our community, in this state, yes, in the nation. Uh, and so I'm going to take advantage of your work and have an opportunity here to announce uh, that we're very soon going to have a, a new tool to strengthen our global programming and integrate it into the fabric of the university. In August, uh, UMB is going to enter the American Council on Educations, the ACE's Internationalization Lab. Uh, it's an 18-month lab designed to position us as a more globally oriented internationally connected university. Uh, and what this is going to look like is that we're going to work with a, uh, a group of experts to examine our internationalization activities. They'll probably use your work, uh, articulate our goals, and uh, come up with a concrete action plan, uh, which hopefully will complement what you've all concluded uh, in taking our efforts forward. Maybe they'll look at what you did and say, we got it. Um, we're going to have a steering committee uh, with representation from all of our schools uh, so that everybody can be connected to the process. Uh, other universities that have graduated from this lab have had great outcomes. Uh, we're told they have more international partnerships, more learning abroad opportunities, and uh, they've been able to garner more donor funding uh, for these efforts. So I want to thank uh, the uh, staff of our Center for Global Education Initiatives, uh, Professor Virginia Rothorn of the School of Law, Bonnie Bissonette, who's the glue for so much of this, and uh, Lori Edwards uh, from the School of Nursing uh, for uh, their dedication to UMB's global mission. And where is Flay? I saw uh, Dr. Lilly. Uh, Thank you for the work that you did and have done in getting us into the ACE lab. Appreciate that. Uh, and the people of the hour need to be thanked more than anybody, uh, all of our fellows, uh, for taking up this important issue of global literacy, helping us to strengthen our, our standing in, in global education. And the advisors who worked with these fine fellows. Uh, in addition uh, to the Center for Global Education Initiative staff, uh, somebody you know well and have met and heard from, uh, Courtney Jones uh, from uh, uh, ISLS, uh, Amy Ramirez from International Services. Amy, where are you? There you are. Thank you. Uh, Isabel May, James Wright from the Writing Center. Are you all here? Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, Hope Wallace from Campus Life Services. Uh, so without further ado, and I know I've probably taken up too much time, uh, let me uh, introduce in no particular order uh, the President's Fellows just to recognize them. Uh, and you'll wave or otherwise indicate who you are. Wesley Chan, Sania Chowdhury, Molly Crothers, Rhea Dave, Alexandra Huss, Esther Kamani, Nana Tafool, and Reverend Todd Yuri. Thank you all. We're eagerly waiting to hear from you, and you look very poised to begin, every single one of you. Please.
you look as great as I do. Um, and so we're happy. <laughs> we're very excited to present all of the work um, that we've been doing over this past year. Uh, just to, to let you know, if you can't hear me, please someone raise a hand. Or if you can't hear any of us, raise a hand. We're not sure about the mic situation. I know we have one, but we don't really want to use it, so we're going to try to do it. Um, okay, so to start, um, before we formally introduce ourselves, I'm just going to give you a few scenarios to kind of set the stage of where um, our frame of thought has been as we do this work, and to give you an idea of kind of what we think global literacy can offer. So Monique is a community health worker. She's hosting a food event at a local recreation center. Monique has spent time and resources working on recipes to give to community members. Monique is unaware that the majority of the food she has prepared can't be eaten by the majority ethnic group in that neighborhood. In the next week, Monique does the same thing with her recipes, not realizing that she is serving them in a food desert and that community members do not have easy access to these ingredients. That's an tale. Greg, we like Greg. We don't know why, we just like his photo. <laughs> Greg is an excited first year dental student who is going with a few classmates to Rwanda for an opportunity to see the country's dentistry practices. While in Rwanda, Greg is offered the opportunity to perform a tooth extraction, something he is not licensed or allowed to do in the United States. Greg is excited for this opportunity, so he does the extraction, but he feels uncomfortable about this happening as he's unsure if it's ethical. He's not sure if he should say anything because he doesn't want to ruin the opportunity to visit Rwanda for other dental students in the future. Lastly, Karen. Karen is a social worker at a women's shelter. Her client, Thierry, is from Myanmar and does not speak English. Residents have complained that this client spits on the bathroom floor and makes them feel disrespected. Karen feels frustrated that Thierry doesn't look her in the eye when they speak and presumes that Thierry isn't interested in services or maybe feels negatively about the shelter. Karen doesn't realize that in Thierry's culture, eye contact can be perceived as rude and spitting is very common. Without training in cultural responsiveness, Karen may misunderstand and likely miss opportunities to enhance the well-being of the client. So hopefully some of those scenarios gave you a little bit of an understanding of some of the things we think students could easily miss if they weren't considering global literacy in their lives. And then we're going to tell you what that is. But first, <laughs> what global literacy is, I mean, um, we're going to introduce ourselves, as you know, President Herman did so, so nicely. Um, my name is Alex Huss, and I am from the School of Social Work, and I am graduating in May. My name is Maria. I'm getting my master's in public health, and I'm also graduating in May. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Samia. I'm a second year pharmacy student, and I'm not graduating in May. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Molly Crothers, and I am a BSN student, and I graduate in May. Um, I'm Nana. I'm from the School of Law, and I'm graduating in May. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wesley Chan. I'm a third year medical student. Hey everybody, my name is Esther Kimani. I'm a fourth year pharmacy student and now I'm also graduating in May. I'm Todd Yeary, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> uh, returning adult in the law school, I hit my third year in the evening division studying uh, human rights and public interest law. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Alex. So when all of us got together in the fall of last year, we had one mission, to define global literacy and bring it into the context of UMB. So I can tell you that when we all came here and we applied for this fellowship, we didn't know what global literacy was. And some people, not going to name any names, but they might have written their essay about reading rates around the world. Guess what? That's not what we're talking about tonight. So if that's what you're here for, sorry. Um, however. As we go through this presentation, I will, we will tell you what global literacy actually is. You're probably wondering, when are they going to tell us when that, what's going to happen? Um, how global literacy is being implemented around other institutions? How UMB is already practicing global literacy? And how UMB can do better? So now, for what you've all been waiting for, Samia will tell you what global literacy actually is. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Are they yeah. Sorry, I can't project like Rhea can. Um, so hi, um, I'm Sunia. Um, 
So um, our first task was to kind of figure out what global literacy was. Um, and as we were doing our research, we realized that there wasn't, there weren't, the, the term global literacy wasn't used as much in the literature as we thought it would be. And so um, we saw terms like these. So global competency, globally educated, um, global citizenship. And so we did have the option to change our topic. Um, and we did consider it, but we realized that we should stick with uh, the term global literacy because it encompassed more of a um, broader scope of ideas. And so um, working through you know, a couple weeks of research and just like putting all of our brains together, we came up with um, this definition. So global literacy is cross-cultural fluency and responsiveness and understanding, engaging and communicating in an interconnected world. So after we came up with the definition, we realized that um, it could be misleading to some people, um, specifically in the, the part of the term literacy. Um, so when most people think about literacy, they think, I have to be an, an expert in this, or I have to have a very good knowledge about something. And so we acknowledge that part of the term, but we also want you to think about the other part of the definition, in which you can't be an expert without putting in a lot of work. And you can't be an expert without you know, exposing yourself to things that you're not used to. And so throughout this presentation, we want you to consider more of that part of the definition in which um, literacy is more of a lifelong learning process. And that's how we want you to frame um, literacy in, um, in your mind for right now. Okay. I don't like the mic. So, um, when it comes to the word global, what I personally think of when I think of global is everything outside of the United States. I think about all the countries that are surrounding us. I don't necessarily think about what's happening here, where we are, however, that's not right. Baltimore also should be considered global. There's so many different people here, there's so many different practices happening that are actually being informed by different processes around the world. So Baltimore is informing global practices, and global pra practices are actually informing Baltimore. The globe is now at our doorsteps, and things need to happen, in, and things are happening in Baltimore that bring it all together. So one way to understand this is as a wise person one told me, one person's global is another person's local. Gonna let that sink in. Dr. Perman did kind of say that. Can I argue with that. <laughs> so, in a personal anecdote, I can tell you that I'm born and bred in Baltimore. So, when I'm here, I only think of the local aspects of it. However, I'm culturally Indian, so when I go to my parents' home in India and I go to the street and I have some food at a street cart, I'm in somebody else's local, but it's become my global. And there are so many different things that are influencing all these aspects that we're a part of. And so that's why it's really important that these global practices be integrated into UMB's framework to bring us to the next level. So with that, I'd like to introduce Molly, who's going to be talking about what's happening at other institutions of global literacy. Did you all come up with that? <laughs> no, that's it, the... Does that exist? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's ours. Our well, that's yours. Our center's local. Copyright thing? Yeah. Thank you, Rhea. Um, so after creating the definition, we conducted an analysis of current practices and um, different paradigms on at different universities that contribute to global literacy. However, the only school that acknowledged and used global literacy as their guiding term to promote global literacy on campus was Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon University created a program called Education for uh, Global Awareness. And this program was about a three to four year process, uh, which started with creating a mission statement about global awareness uh, on campus. So they proceeded to give seed grants to selected faculty to implement classes related to the mission. And then based on these classes, the faculty members created components of global literacy. Um, yeah, and that, that can be seen on pages four to six, or page four, sorry. Uh, and then after these components were made, they implemented these classes into the curriculum institutionally wide. 
So since Carnegie Mellon was the only university we were able to find that used the term, we used other terms to expand our research. We determined that there are many different uh, paradigms and programs that contribute to a globally literate student. So some of these practices we determined are education abroad, service learning, global health education, faculty and curriculum development, and comprehensive internationalization, which I will discuss further. So this graphic uh, explains the components that create a globally literate student. So the smaller circle that starts with education abroad are individual components that contribute to a globally literate student. So a university can just implement an education abroad uh, program and just say that they created a globally literate student and toss up their hands. Um, but we discovered that implementing more of these programs uh, contribute to a broader and more holistic approach uh, to creating a globally literate uh, student. And that term is called comprehensive internationalization. So that encompasses a multitude of paradigms and programs. So to save some time and to save everyone's uh, attention spans, uh, we are not going to dive deep into the best practices of each one of these programs, but they can be seen on pages four to six. Um, but it is important to implement these best practices because uh, evidence shows that these are the best outcomes uh, that students have when they participate in these programs. So students that participate in these programs develop cross-cultural skills, they have higher education achievement, they have a greater understanding of one's own cultural values and biases. They have enhanced self-confidence and openness to new ideas. It influences their career choice, and it improves performance as an employee. Next, we learn that faculty and curriculum development actually correlate to students' continual global learning better than education abroad or a global health program because it creates a whole cultural change throughout the campus, and it helps students engage with global activities at, on an everyday basis and throughout their whole education. So Schorholtz Lair states, to be able to teach for global awareness and intercultural sensitivity among learners, instructors have to be socially responsible and interculturally knowledgeable citizens themselves. So some ways universities are employing or encouraging their faculty to be interculturally uh, knowledgeable citizens are by creating teacher workshops and having incentives for faculty development and global experiences such as grants or including a global engagement piece and tenure requirements. So in regards to the curriculum, incorporating global education into schools on our campuses such as medicine, nursing, law is really difficult because we have so many uh, requirements that already need to be fulfilled. However, programs such as the Department of Physical Therapy at Thomas Jefferson University use accrediting requirements and ethical codes to create an international course and uh, clinical experiences to get around this limitation. And then foreign language requirements have also been suggestion, suggested. <laughs> So we touched on comprehensive internationalization a little earlier, but American Council on Education, which is the uh, organization that uh, is in charge of the ACE internationalization lab that we'll, we'll be participating in later, uh, defines this term as a strategic coordinated process that seeks to align and integrate international policies, programs, and initiatives, and positions colleges and universities as more globally oriented and internationally connected. So that's a little long and complicated um, definition. So what that means is that comprehensive internationalization is a process that implements many programs and paradigms, such as the education abroad and faculty development, to help many universities promote global literacy on their campuses. And finally, these are the top priorities that universities focus on to internationalize their campuses. And in fact, internationalizing the curriculum and faculty development have been correlated to a stronger global learning in their students 
Um, so increasing study abroad opportunities have is great, but um, providing the top two, focusing on the top two, actually have been shown to have better outcomes within their students. So overall, these practices can help guide UMB's framework for creating a globally, globally literate student and help analyze the practices that we have now. So Nana will now talk about uh, what UMB has to offer. Um, so before we began developing recommendations for enhancing global literacy on campus, we wanted to educate ourselves on what was already in place to that end, both centrally and at an individual school level. Um, so we each conducted interviews, informal ones, with deans or faculty representatives from each of the schools, um, and we received valuable information from each of them and were pointed to resources for further research. So several university-wide um, programs exist currently. Um, the Center for Global Education Initiatives um, with Ms. Bonnie in Virginia um, has a broad goal of engaging students and faculty here with global and local communities. Um, and it does this by facilitating um, experiential learning opportunities and offering services like financial assistance and logistical support for students and faculty who want to travel and pursue these opportunities. And I'm actually a beneficiary of um, a GLO grant from the CGEI when I went to study abroad in Switzerland last, last year. Um, the Office of International Student Services is similarly a central support resource, but it focuses specifically on international students on campus and acclimating them to the campus. Um, so it helps them and their families with a variety of, um, in a variety of ways, such as um, employment, empl employer-sponsored visas, um, housing, academics, taxes, federal immigration regulation, um, and it divulges this information through workshops, orientations, um, and peer mentoring. Um, so oftentimes, an international student will be matched with a student here on campus just to help ease their transition and so. Um, the Diversity Advisory Council is a body of students, faculty, and staff from each of the schools and centrally, um, which, it, which exists to provide policy recommendations to the president, um, just to sort of make the campus more equitable, um, inclusive, diverse, and so forth. And the Community Engagement Center is supposed to serve as a link between the campus and the wider Baltimore community. Um, and it promotes volunteer opportunities in a variety of areas from neighborhood beautification to domestic violence to high school mentorship. Um, and finally, under the President's Student, Student Leadership Institute, um, students can pursue a year-long certificate in one of five tracks. Um, and some of these tracks touch on global literacy in some way. For example, there's a track in effective leadership, inclusive leadership, community engagement, um, and they must, students must also meet a 30-hour service requirement, and this is open to students from any school on campus. Um, and as President Perman mentioned, coming in August 2018 is the American Council of Education's Internationalization Lab, and council experts will be working closely with the university to analyze what's currently in place with regards to internationalization um, activities and strat strategize on how to advance them at an institutional level. So from conversations with representatives from each school, we ascertained that global literacy is a key skill that um, this school trains professionals for. Um, and But as the curricula currently stand, global literacy is more of an optional and not a mandatory aspect. Um, so that means essentially that students can graduate with, with a high level of global literacy if they so choose, if they take advantage of optional electives and extracurricular activities available, but they don't necessarily have to. Um, and even with many of the international offerings, um, students are faced with insufficient resources to pursue, to pursue them. 
Um, so while we'll be making recommendations for how the administration can better support students um, who wish to take advantage of global learning opportunities, um, we did want to highlight a positive trend across all the schools that we noticed and will go into, and that's a commitment to community <coughs> engagement. Um, so keeping in mind that one's local is another school goal, as we mentioned, um, the schools have demonstrated a very strong commitment through the core curriculum and extracurricular service opportunities to get students engaged in the Baltimore community. So we'll be looking through um, what each of the schools currently has in place now. Um, so at the School of Law, two courses, International Law and Health and International Human Rights, um, are dedicated specifically to exposing students to legal matters arising outside the United States. Um, on the community engagement front, the clinical law program, um, which is nationally recognized, um, and each student has to spend at least a semester in this clinical law program, and they work under faculty supervision to provide legal services to low-income clients here in Baltimore. Um, and the, the clinical law program offers a variety of clinics in many areas from healthcare delivery to low-income taxpayer to um, consumer protection, gender violence, and so forth. Um, at the School of Medicine, um, in addition to courses offered such as Intro to Clinical Medicine and Medical Spanish, um, two important centers are housed there, um, the Institute of Human Virology and the Institute for Global Health. Um, they are one of a kind in the nation. Um, the Institute for Global Health it was more recently established in 2015, but medical students do have some limited opportunities to, partic to participate in some of the cu cutting edge research going on at these institutes. And um, for example, at the Center for Vaccine Development, they work on very innovative um, malaria prevention and um, diagnostic tools that they can send out abroad and so forth. Um, so at the School of Pharmacy, um, actually, fun fact, the School of Pharmacy has the most international students out of all the other schools on campus. And um, they have offered various international experiential rotations um, in countries like South Korea, Puerto Rico. Um, they also have a number of community engagement initiatives, including patients, um, the behavioral, be, behavioral health research team, um, which is committed to substance abuse prevention and so forth, and the International Visiting Scholars Program, which welcomes international students and faculty from abroad. Um, the School of Social Work has two cornerstone requirements for its graduates. The first is the diversity requirement um, in which each student is required to enroll in a three credit course that focuses primarily on diversity content, either local or global. Um, some of the courses that have been offered to satisfy this requirement are um, working with children and immigrants and refugees and then international social welfare those have been offered. Um, another is the field practicum placement. Um, each student is required to hold two field practicum placements um, in order to receive their degree. And many of them are in Baltimore, but two have been offered abroad, one in London, UK, and the other in um, Kerala, India. Um, the School of Nursing is particularly unique in that it is the only school with the designated Office of Global Health. And this Office of Global Health offers a Global Health Certificate Program. Um, this is open to any student on campus, and it's a 12-credit certificate program um, covering courses such as critical issues in global health. It also has a service requirement attached to it. Um, and in the BSN curricular, it's, um, curriculum itself, um, two important courses are required, physiopharmacology and a community health course, both of which have community service or clinical components attached. And finally, at the School of Dentistry, the Office of Global Student Exchange Programs exists. Um, and this, this year, in January, actually, it welcomed its first cohort of students from China. Um, the Dean's Community Service Initiatives also exist, as well as externships in Tanzania, the DR, and so forth. So um, another way we analyzed the campus landscape um, was through a survey that was sent out campus-wide, and Wes will be telling you about those results. Um, but overall, the graduate schools 
do value global literacy and have demonstrated a strong commitment to community engagement. However, we believe that competing priorities have pushed global literacy out of the forefront, and we will be making recommendations to, toward a more concerted effort to train globally literate, globally literate students here. So as Nana mentioned, we conducted a survey during our research of, and we got about 700 responses from UMB students as well as faculty. Um, what we asked questions such as, is global literacy important? Is it important to be globally literate in your profession? One of our questions that we asked was, there is enough global opportunities uh, for you in your school? And as we can see here, over 50% of students believed that and thought they didn't have enough global opportunities offered to them at their school from all, from all schools um, across UMB. More statistics-wise, 89% of students believe that it was, global, it was important to be global literate to be successful in their professions. Only 42% of students believed that, um, agreed that uh, there was enough global opportunities offered to them at their school. Only 19% of faculty believed there was only there was enough global uh, learning opportunities in the central UMB level, and also 82% of faculty believed there was significant barriers for global learning opportunities for students, citing rigid curricular structure as well as narrow objective competency. As well as part of our survey, we asked students why global literate is being global literate is so important to you. And some of the notable quotes that we got was that people are not robots. Care must be personalized in a melting pot like you in Maryland and like the university, United States at large. The demand for global literacy is even greater in order to ensure personalized care. Another quote we got was, we live in a city that is very diverse with many immigrants, refugees, and movement. The more globally literate you are, the easier it is to be culturally sensitive and cognizant of other backgrounds and beliefs as something they will bring to a medical interaction, and that their cultural beliefs are never bad, just different. And students really wanted to see that, um, to make it a requirement within each course to have a lesson on global literacy geared toward that specific course, as they also would like to set, uh, UMB to set out like a campaign video highlighting all the events geared towards global literacy. So what we have talked about so far in our research is our research um, with what Molly talked about, uh, what global literacy, um, you know, other universities are doing about global literacy, what Nana talked about through our um, conversation with um, deans as well as faculty representatives, as well as just talked about with our survey, just really provided a framework for us as scholars to really um, provide us, uh, provide you guys some recommendations, what we believe UMB can do to move forward to really train global literacy students, which Esther and Alex will be now talking about. So the next section is the recommendation section. This section is divided into three parts, short term, long term, and now. I'm going to be talking about short term. <clears throat> For short term, I'm going to start by sharing with you the recommendation that we as fellows would make to UMB as a whole. And then next, I'm going to go into recommendations that are specific to each school. So our first recommendation is we would we would recommend that a designated staff liaison is chosen or hired for each school. The, the role of this designated staff liaison will be to you know, keep track of all the resources that are available in each school, and they will also maintain communication be between the different schools just to make sure that there's accountability between schools, that you know, global literacy is continuing to be enhanced and to be fostered. The second recommendation is to bring a global honor society to campus, such as Phi, Phi Beta Delta. Phi Beta Delta is a national honor society that encourages, that's open for both faculty and students. If UMB joined, brought this uh, honor society on campus, it would make sure that students and faculty 
may continue to be challenged by other students at a national level. And this would make, this would, uh, this would ensure that UMB is not being left behind and that we're continuing to remain, we're continuing to enhance global literacy for both our faculty and students. Because as we saw earlier, if our faculty are not globally, globally literate, it's difficult for them to, you know, equip our students and our, our graduate students with the necessary skills and, and tools for them to become to become uh, globally literate way after they leave UMB and they begin their various practices. Our third and final short-term recommendation is to require a language course for all students. This will be an interdisciplinary Spanish course that's, a bit, that's required for students. And so it will bring you know, pharmacy students, law students, nursing students together. And we believe that such an experience would enable students to understand you know, the barriers that can be brought by not being able to understand a language. And we believe that once these students graduate and they're working, for example, in a community uh, pharmacy or they're having a clinic and they encounter a patient who, who cannot understand English, I believe they would take more time to ensure that this patient, you know, like a translator is brought is brought on board just so the you know although a patient cannot speak English they're still offered optimal health so next I'm gonna go into recommendations that are specific to each school as far as uh, the law school we recommend bringing back the international clinic so that students can be able to practice law alongside lawyers in different settings such an opportunity will this opportunity will enable, will enrich law students' experiences, and it's going to enable them to have an international aspect, even as they practice law. They can be able to learn from others who have more experience. And as rising students and soon-to-be graduates, they once they go into practice, they will they will have more, you know, they will be more globally literate. As far as the School of Medicine, we'd recommend that we develop more pathways for medical students to study and research with faculty at the Institute of uh, Human Virology, as well as in Baltimore and at, the, at an international level. If students are provided with opportunities to interact with, our, with students uh, internationally, they can be able to learn what students across the sea are across the seas are doing, and you know skills may be aspects that they are better than you know we are, and that would foster more knowledge, and that would also make sure that our our students are are conducting research to the best of their ability. Would also recommend that we focus on we focus on teaching our medical students on how to think globally and act locally you know the world is changing at a very high rate you know we're becoming we have become a global world and if you're not aware of what's going on in the world it's really difficult for you know for you to offer great service even with with the knowledge that we're acquiring from umb and so it's we, we recommend that you know students are taught and they're given opportunities that will help them to really think globally. We would also uh, recommend providing effective pre-departure training. A lot of our students uh, you know engage in international rotations and we feel we believe that more could be done to prepare these students because a lot of students, a lot of students may not be aware of the different cultures that they will encounter when they go when they go to a particular country. And so by making sure that our students are adequately prepared, they're able to, you know, those those cultural differences are no longer going to become a hindrance for the students to provide the, you know, the services and the the services that they, they intend to provide when they go overseas. As far as, as far as the School of Social Work, we would recommend that a required course is developed for is developed for global literacy. This course will also include cultural competence and as it pertains to both local as well as at an international level. You know, 
would also would also suggest that cultural content is provided for social work students before they engage before they are placed in different field placements. You know, social work students deal with a lot of various cases, and sometimes if a student is uh, is <laughs> if a student is uh, put in a situation where they're not really sure or they're not prepared how to receive news from a patient, it can it can hinder their ability to really use the knowledge that they have to help that patient. And so we would really recommend that these students are adequately prepared and they're aware of the kind of scenarios that they will face. That way when they do go into this field placement, they are able to use the knowledge that they have learned and they are able to meet the patient's needs. For School of Nursing, we would recommend that we provide a development workshop or toolkit on global literacy for faculty members. So this toolkit will include like, you know, how to handle different situations and this could be available to the faculty as well as students. That way, as our, student, our nursing students continue to learn, they, they have access, they have tools that they can go, you know, go and look into in case they're not sure, you know, how would I handle this situation? Just to make sure that also our nursing students are well prepared. Last but not least, our recommendations for the School of Pharmacy is to provide students with effective pre-departure training and prior to experiential rotations as well as internet volunteer uh, mid or uh, volunteer opportunities internationally as you saw pharmacy school the pharmacy school does engage in a lot of inter does offer a lot of international rotations and they also do have a lot of um, international opportunities and you know i spoke to one of our pharmacy student who actually had a rotation in australia and i i asked him you know how was how was your training prior to going to your rotation and one of the feedback they gave me was you know we didn't really cover stuff like cultural competence I, I didn't feel adequately trained on how to you know handle some cultural situations and so we would suggest that you know pharmacy students are also provided with more pre, more effective pre-departure training as you know UMB is already doing a lot. We have a lot of programs available for our students, but we feel that you know a lot more could be done to enhance global literacy, so that our graduating students are you know adequately prepared to to be global literate, literate and to spread this you know way beyond graduation and into their practices that when they do encounter patients that are you know from another culture or from another country they you know they're able the barriers are not going to hinder the, that graduate from really um, using the skills and the knowledge they have learned to meet the needs of the patient and now i'm going to turn it over to alex and she's going to talk about the long-term goals so um, thank you all for bearing with us so far. This is kind of towards the end, so <laughs> um, I know it's a long day. Um, so um, in, kind of, in regards to what Esther said, um, not only do we think more could be done, we believe more should be done. Um, you know, it's really how you view it. But <laughs> I personally think more should be done in order to keep us at the level of what UMB is truly capable of and has been showing us so far that they have a committed interest in. Obviously, we were tasked with bringing up global literacy, so it must be a value. So if we, if we value this, then it's time that we reach our highest potential in this area. So what we learned from the ACE Lab, we actually were lucky enough to have a pre-meeting with them, and they taught us that faculty and curriculum were the two most important elements. We've talked about that already. So we've um, sort of started you know, figuring out what, what can we do about faculty and curriculum. So in terms of faculty tenure and promotion practices, from what I've learned, this is a very uh, tenuous issue. <laughs> you don't just change tenure practices, apparently. That's not how that works. But um, what we would recommend, instead of requiring global literacy for tenure, would just be to have it be something that is encouraged, something that's a bonus to your application, not a requirement for your application. Um, something that uh, we, we've heard from other faculty, maybe, that they feel they don't have as many opportunities to, to go abroad or to lead different missions because they feel that um, it, would, it would actually hinder their ability to get tenure. So we think that that should be changed. We think that it should be um, something that makes it easier to get tenure, perhaps. Um, curriculum offerings and evaluations. Uh, we think there should 
be infused in every class at some point, perhaps something about global literacy. We think that there should be self-reflections going on in, in as many courses as possible, um, and evaluations of those courses. The students should be able to say, did you learn about this? Do you feel that this was sufficient for you? Did you wish you had more? Um, if we, yeah, it's great to offer them, and I know personally in, in School of Social Work, I love a lot of my diversity courses that I've ha had the chance to take, um, but without evaluation, how do we know that they're really doing anything? Um, and also, we, like we said before, we want these to reach every student. We want it to be a requirement that you have to be a globally literate student to graduate from UFD. So in order to attain that, we'd like it to be infused in every curriculum. Um, international relationships with universities. UMB is ever-changing. We just found out like a week ago um, that uh, the medical school will be pairing with the university in Korea to uh, share ideas. And we think that this should be happening for each school as much as possible. If this is something that isn't that, um, wouldn't have to be necessarily that expensive or timely to happen. We can, now we have the beautiful internet, and we can um, have chat rooms where we're all learning maybe in different languages, maybe with different countries, maybe even just in a different school in the United States. Um, just learning from a different group as we're learning would be an amazing opportunity. Um, one big barrier that we, we people talked about is funds. It's hard to, you don't just get to go abroad. Yay, everything's happy. Um, that would be amazing. And what we would like is for those people who are challenged by their funds to have kind of like a pool that we have raised for scholarships or grants for those students um, who do want to find the financial aspect as a barrier. Um, Pre-departure training. This is, I think, something that's really important, not just for pre-departure for international opportunities, but also local opportunities. Um, it's, we, we didn't talk about this enough, but voluntourism is this well-known thing where people like to go into developing countries and take photos of themselves um, with kids and, and an elephant and say that they did what they had to do. Um, and that's a pretty uh, frustrating trend. Um, and so we think that uh, pre-departure trainings could be something that could help curb that something that could hopefully humble the students before they go into that country to realize that they have more, probably more to learn than they have to give, and that's okay. And, that's, and um, learning that will make them better professionals in the future. Um, and increasing connection between schools. This is not an exhaustive list of everything we have here, because we don't know everything we have here. <laughs> and we don't know everything we have here because um, communication between schools is a very difficult issue. Um, and we've suggested some liaisons and um, a, frater a global uh, program, but we think that even just you know advertising what people have, making sure there's maybe one database where all of that information is connected would be really important. Um, and also, this is not an exhaustive list um, of our goals. We have a lot more goals, and there, a lot of them are listed. Um, and these are just the ones that we chose that we thought were the most pressing and the ones that were most necessary to make UMB the great institution that we believe it is and can be. And that leads us to our thank yous. And the thank yous are really dittos. Uh, we certainly uh, join Dr. Perman uh, in thanking all of those who have made this uh, effort uh, possible. But uh, one person that he left off of the list uh, out of propriety and modesty is himself. So we want to start with thanking President Perman for the opportunity uh, to learn and collaborate and to come to this point uh, to our advisors who have uh, encouraged, inspired, uh, cajoled, nudged, reminded, and walked with us every step of the way, Virginia Rothorn, Rothorn and Bonnie Bissonette. Uh, Jim Wright in the Writing Center, his uh, ideas early on kept us on target. Uh, as uh, President Perman mentioned, Isabel May, Courtney Jones Carney, uh, Hope Wallace uh, have all made this possible, and not on this list, but certainly present in the room. I think it's also a good time to thank all of the family members and the friends uh, who have uh, tolerated some absences, maybe some tardiness at uh, key events along the way, so that we might uh, make it to this point. Uh, I'm going to Kind of close it out, but uh, after we've heard about the, uh, the connections between global and local, uh, the best practices, the uh, sentiment and the feedback from the schools, uh, the wonderful demand potential that we saw from the surveys, and uh, the objective opportunities that we have uh, in terms of goal setting, uh, 
Uh, it brings us back to early on in the presentation, our working definition for global literacy. And just to recite it again, without its cross-cultural fluency and responsiveness in understanding, engaging, and communicating in an interconnected world. So we started with two words, global literacy. Now I want to end with two words, particularly these. So what? Uh, the question of relevance is always an important question that has to be raised whenever we come to the presentation of a white paper. It's, it's good for ideas. It stimulates some thought. But how are we going to translate it from theory to praxis? How is it going to become part of the DNA of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, particularly in an age, as Dr. Perman uh, stated early on, there is this force, there's this forcefulness between cultural regression and nationalistic isolation that requires that as an educational institution, one that's preparing professionals to go out and make a difference in the world, we've got to push back on that trend not only in terms of regressive politics, but a regressive politics that will take down the gains that have been made in global education generally. And so if we're going to deal with the so what, I want you to meet me at the intersection between global opportunity and global commitment. The global commitment shows up in the mission, uh, in the strategic plan, rather, uh, of the university. And this is where we actually see in process a commitment to the two ideals that President Perman mentioned early on. The university will extend its reach with hallmark local and global initiatives that positively transform lives and our economy. The university will be a beacon to the world as an environment for learning and discovery that is rich in diversity and inclusion. Without dating myself too much, one of the uh, shows I watched as a kid uh, was called A Different World. And the tagline from the theme song was this line. It's a different world from where we've come from. Whether we like it or not, whether we agree with it or not, the world is changing. And the world is going to continue to change. The question that we have to ask personally and collaboratively and institutionally, are we going to be a part of the movement for progressive change? that helps to impact the future of the world. So I would leave you uh, with two quotes, not to, uh, as uh, President Perman said, not to politicize the moment. But what we do know is education has been viewed as not a constitutional right. It's actually been given voice that way. So if we're going to have the privilege, with the privilege comes the responsibility and the obligation to push back and to push back forcefully against the trends toward isolationism. These two quotes, one is from Sidney Harris, late uh, journalist who wrote for the Chicago Sun-Times. He said, the whole purpose of education is to turn mirrors into windows. We spend a lot of time idolizing our reflections. And so in many ways, the critique of the United States is that we view everyone else as a thing as opposed to a relationship. This is an opportunity to build institutional, interpersonal, interconnected relationship with the rest of the world. Finally, the late Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. It's not a war, but there is a battle going on for the minds, the hearts, the future of those who don't have the opportunities that very often we take for granted. Because it's a different world from where we've come from, I would invite you, I would even encourage you, I would even plead with you, I would beg that if we're going to change the world, let's not just change the world for change's sake. Let's change the world and make the world better. Let's be good in global literacy and turn these mirrors into windows. Here's to global literacy.
Uh, I'm sure there are uh, questions, critiques, rebuttals, uh, which is what we do in a university uh, for our fine fellows here. Uh, but uh, I want to say at the outset uh, that as I listened to each of you, I thought about the chutzpah that I demonstrate, maybe most of the students here don't remember it because it's on your first day on campus when you're getting oriented, and I often wonder how much you hear. Uh, but uh, I do have the nerve to tell people like yourselves who are paying to be here that I have an expectation of you, despite the fact that you're paying to be here. I have an expectation of each of you, and I say it in each orientation, that you will leave the place better than the way you found it. And when you make contributions like this, you have done exactly that. So on behalf of the entire university community, a big thank you. Now, what would you like to say to the fellows, ask the fellows? Dean Bart, let's start with you. After that stirring closing uh, by Reverend Yuri, I'm a little reluctant to get into the nitty gritty of your recommendations, but I, I want to do that some. Um, one of them is around the required Spanish language course. Uh, it doesn't say required in the um, program, but you did express it as needing to be required. And having had six years of um, junior and senior high school Spanish and a year of college, and only being able to say, um, hola, vamos, and adios, um, I wonder whether that time wouldn't actually be spent better helping us to figure out what are the technical aspects and the electronics of best practices related to using translational software and, um, and really figuring out how to do something more significant that could actually get into a little more depth than I could probably ever get into with another um, four months of, of Spanish. Maybe we discuss that, I don't know. Uh, I think the reason that we came up with it being language, specifically, regard, it's not really about knowing Spanish. I don't think we expect anyone to learn Spanish in this one credit Spanish course, like, actually. I mean, ideally they would. Um, but really it's about the continued, like, kind of like the humbleness of learning, and learning in a, in a concept that's, that's foreign to you. I think we'd be very open to that one credit course being about translation services or another language. Spanish is just right now the most prominent one, obviously. Um, we'd be, our recommendations are not like steadfast, you have to do this, absolutely not. It's just an ideas that we have to start getting, getting the juices flowing on ways that we could change the culture on campus. As far as, from what I noticed, um, I've seen on the chart of the surveys that were given out, um, most graduate students, uh, I guess collectively show that there was a lack of um, global opportunity for those programs. Um, and y'all might already have answered it before, but as far as the recommendations that you guys made um, for each of the other schools, I was wondering if you guys had any ideas or um, any programs that could be implemented within the graduate school itself, or if um, it'll be difficult in a sense as far as like the barriers that may come with um, having strict curriculums in that sense. We often think about professional schools, and I think each of you is a representative of a professional school, and yet we have a seventh school here at UMB. So thank you for your question. Any response? I, I think one of the, the opportunities on the graduate school side is to expand our understanding of global, uh, globalization, global relationship, also has a local component to it. So even as you are working through how you discover what the options are, it could be that the first place you start is what very often we call ground zero. And there's often a very high demand in neighborhoods right here for there to be some strategic relationship. And it could be that as a starting point to begin this process, building some relationship in context might be helpful and then leave some time to explore where the beyond the national border opportunities might lie. Um, and I can add on to that. And also, we didn't um, we didn't ask if 
how they found out about um, global uh, programs on their campuses. So we don't know if it's because it's a lack of knowledge that they aren't aware of programs, um, which could be something else that we could explore or um, university can explore farther. Um, and we just we said that in our recommendations that there should be a uh, central location where students can find all the programs and um, help and resources out there. I just would like to add that um, just as the last uh, speaker spoke about, starting from ground zero, working with some of the communities here in the USA, because you do have areas like Chinatown and areas where you have a high density of a particular ethnic group, you, you would have that opportunity. But I'd also like to draw your attention to resources within the World Bank, that, uh, because they are in so many other countries, that's another source of getting information on backgrounds and so forth. So even as you prepare your students for the pre-departure, that you, you get them to really understand that you're going out there to enjoy what is going on out there and bring it back so that you can understand what goes on here. Because there's no doubt that you will be situated in an area, Washington DC, Maryland, Virginia area, where you have a melting pot, so many people from different parts of the world. And you never know when you will get a very nice job somewhere else that you can bring that experience to bear immediately, you acclimatize and become one of the global citizens, as it were. So thank you for this, and thank you for bringing it to the attention of the university. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, uh, it's, it's a comment size question. Um, I love the presentation, and I see the university see, sitting at the crossroads between local initiatives and global initiatives. And for me, um, I don't live in Baltimore, but I am a service member to the city because I work in the city. And um, I'm a filmmaker. So for me, I'm always thinking about how to challenge the narrative that people outside of Baltimore see Baltimore as. For me, everyone sees Baltimore as the liar. I'm sure everyone's heard of that. So for me, um, I've been able to take upon advantage from personally of um, the medical sciences in Baltimore. So I, my question for you guys is, how do you plan to change the, do you plan to, how would you plan to change the narrative of the city of Baltimore, what it has to offer? Because I see it as a huge um, hub for medicine and scientific innovations. Um, my mother has ALS, so she attends Johns Hopkins University. We go there on a, you know, multi-month -month basis. So connecting with other institutions in the city to kind of reclaim the city as something that brings that energy um, on the East Coast, I just want to get an opinion on how you guys kind of see that implement so that when you go across the country, people know Baltimore has all the innovations that you need from a medical, pharmaceutical perspective. What is the gist and what's your thought on that? I think that the way to go about that would be to train our professionals and the people that are going out into the world to be more globally literate so that when they go out there and you hear, you ask where did you go where did you get your schooling and you go oh I went to UMB and they go oh there's more to Baltimore then it's because it's what you're offering to them at that point in time so the narrative might not change in the media or it might not change from what they read but it's personally what you can bring to somebody else and what you learn from here that you can take out to the world. And I think uh, UMB participating in the ACE Internationalization Lab um, is just the beginning of us farthering our position in the United States and globally. Todd? The question you raise is one of agency. Who controls the story? And to Dean Vard's question earlier, I think that's why I have some hesitance about translation services. Because what we know about translation, there's this joke that I learned early on in grad school. If, if, uh, if you speak three languages, you're multilingual. If you speak two languages, you're bilingual. If you speak one language, you're American. <laughs> <laughs> because in order to learn another language, it's not you imposing the interpretation and the agency on someone else. It's you being vulnerable enough to learn how they see the world on their terms. And so I think it's important that as we're finding out about these stories, global literacy is so important because 
it allows other folks to claim their story. I moved here from Chicago, and the first thing I pastored in the city, in a neighborhood that my church is actually in some of the scenes in the wire, and some of my members were extras. And so the question I had was, is Baltimore like the wire? That was my first question as an outsider coming in. Here's what I discovered. When Baltimore was given the opportunity to have agency and to tell its story on its own terms, is that Baltimore is probably the prize jewel that is often uh, underrated and misunderstood in terms of what the future, the potential of a great city actually looks like. And the fact that this university is situated in this city at this time is a powerful opportunity that cannot be missed, but we've got to leave room for folks to be able to tell their own story. Um, I just wanted to speak to the fact that, you know, this is predominantly a health professions campus, and the law school is in a, in a unique position, um, and me participating in the healthcare delivery clinic was really interesting so, to your question about how we connect with bigger organizations like the hospitals. Um, we had a very interesting medical legal partnership going on and sort of working with health professionals and even the social work school to provide some of those legal services to the community was one of the ways in which we're. I also think um, retention in Baltimore, keeping our students in Baltimore, is something that's really important that we should gear some of our um, attention towards. Uh, it's kind of frustrating for me when I hear my friends who are like, I'm from New York, but I'm going to go back. Um, you've learned so much about this, this city, you've learned so much here, you know a little bit more than someone else who knows nothing, and to, to continue to give those skills back to Baltimore, I think is also something we should value. Some of you know that uh, I have the privilege uh, and the challenge of sitting at the mayor's table, if you will, often. She would be so proud to hear what you all just said. And just to add on, I think it also starts with, you know, forums like this where students actually engage in research on global literacy because it, it, you know like my, my experience with conducting this research it has changed me because when I leave here and when people actually read what we wrote it begins to create ideas it begins to make you think outside the box and think about you know issues and things that, you know like terms that you never even considered and so I believe it's experiences that, such as this and knowledge and you know exchange of knowledge that will also help people to begin to view Baltimore in a, in a different way and to also you know change the change the images or the ideas of how people view it well uh, one more question my question is uh, you know you mentioned that uh, faculty, Workshops, curriculum development were the number two things, the two top things that uh, ACE identified. Um, but I'm curious, because of the fact that you're all students, right? What role do the students play, or what role do you believe the students play in changing the curriculum, in changing the way faculty uh, address students and address their classrooms? Today, I am actually the student liaison for the curriculum committee of the MPH program. And so we, I, my input also goes into what's happening in the curriculum. And so I think that could be something that happens in all of the schools, that if they're going to think about changing the curriculum, students should also be a part of that. I think that's also happening in the medical school right now. I'm sure I've heard my friends talking about have, going to curriculum meetings, but that could be something that's happening in all schools where they have forums to hear what students have to say. Anybody else want to respond? Well, I know in school... How do students influence curriculum? I know School of Social Work, there's like, I think, three or four um, organizations right now who are trying to have kind of a cultural responsiveness course required. And there's been, there's been a lot of talks and attempts at corp uh, cooperation about um, making sure that social work students... So social work students, I mean, we're activists, hopefully. There's a social justice component of social work. So we're going to be the people who you know, stand up, but also making that space in other um, institutions. So making, you know, encouraging other schools or leaving a space so that they could come together and create a club, not just of their own volition, but maybe a faculty in your school who leads like uh, what, uh, I don't know, uh, I guess requests, uh, which would be more towards what Rio was saying, but even, just, even if beyond that. Um, I also think our faculty should be held accountable when they're not. Um, sometimes as a student, 
you know, it would be on, the onus is on you to say this faculty said something that I felt rubbed me the wrong way, it didn't exhibit global literacy. Um, so I guess that's something that would be really hard to encourage, but something that would be something we all have to kind of do and think about. And hopefully with more global literacy, we'll start questioning more and feel even more inclined towards, towards making those efforts ourselves. Also, at the end of every course, we do get evaluations. And these are ways where students can voice their opinions as to, you know, maybe make recommendations to faculty as to what they could add on to their course. So with, you know, global literacy being encouraged on campus, students can also use that channel of evaluation, course evaluations to recommend changes so that we can, we can increase uh, global literacy in our courses. So to add on to that, I think that the onus is kind of on students to seek out those opportunities. I mean, we get the, the evaluation sometimes and we don't spend much time on it. Or we get bogged down by our curricula and we don't seek out the things we like. We, I mean, we heard from some of the deans in our interviews that they have events and students don't show up. So um, we also need to like sort of know what we want and go after it and not just focus on school and that's hard. But, but I do think it's circular kind of like if you have one professor who's telling you to know what you want and go after it and be an advocate, and then another professor who's saying something that you think is horribly offensive, hopefully what you learn from that professor and you know the, the faculty building will will kind of lend its way towards you being more likely to make to make that change. And, I, and I'm going to raise the, the elephant in the room that often doesn't get raised. This is a, this is an educational relationship, but it's also an economic one. And if we don't take seriously the uh, the interdependent relationship around raising critical issues, very often what you will see is that your retention is going to be affected. Uh, very often we take for granted that being a tier one school, there's always somebody waiting in the wings to take somebody's place that's not going to stay. But you can only ride on that kind of overconfidence for so long before that rug's going to get pulled out from under you. And so if there's a serious understanding that there's a value proposition that the university is making in exchange for that T word that everybody looks at, there are a couple of things when I was looking at schools to figure out where I wanted to go to grad school every time. What's your ranking and what's your cost? And if your cost doesn't align with what I think your ranking should be, then I'm not going to pay what you're asking me to pay because what comes back is not of equal value. So I think we got to make sure that we never lose sight of that fact that it's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling that we have while we're here together, that this is really an economic relationship and we've got to get high value for high return as part of every process that we have. Well, I'm glad I uh, said what I said earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I the folks are who are paying. <laughs> uh, and on that note, and in all seriousness, uh, on behalf of the university, uh, we thank you for your work, uh, for the research you've done, the interviews you've conducted, and we promise to take seriously under consideration the recommendations that you've made. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I think we have some opportunity to socialize together. Please.